Welcome to the Next Gen Show. My name is Benjamin Brain, performance and leadership coach for next generation leaders in family businesses. And with this podcast, it's my mission to share with you the stories, experiences, and lessons learned from other accomplished next generation leaders from across the UK. So on today's show, I was joined by Gavin Howarth of Howarths. Now, Howarths, a successful HR and employment law firm in West Yorkshire, was launched by Gavin's parents back in 2003 after his father retired from a successful 30-year career in the police force. After studying law at uni and completing two years practicing as a trainee solicitor at one of the UK's largest law firms, Gavin joined the family quit business and quickly rose through the ranks, becoming managing director of the firm nine years ago at the age of just 27. Since then, the business has grown year on year to become an outstanding example of a successful, values-led family business that's built an excellent reputation for itself, not just in the industry and with clients, but also in the local community, thanks to the Howarth Foundation, a charity set up by the family in 2017 to help the homeless get back into employment. Now, this was a, a brilliant, no-holds-barred interview into leadership in the family business with an ambitious, passionate, and people-focused managing director who's not afraid to lead from the front and is quickly becoming a voice of inspiration and wisdom to other aspiring business leaders from across the UK. So without further ado, this is Gavin Howarth. Okay, so joined by Gavin Howarth today on the Next Gen Show. Gavin, thanks for taking out some time. I know you're a busy man to join us on the podcast. I've been Really looking forward to talking to you, especially after some uh, viral posts of late. You are most definitely probably most high profile celebrity on LinkedIn that I've spoken to now. <laughs> I don't know about that, but thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So the, the way I always like to start these podcasts is because I'm always talking to next generation, whether it's second, third, fourth or fifth, it's just to take it back to the beginning of the business that you're in now. So obviously, House is the family business. We know a bit about who you are what the business does, when it was founded, et cetera, from the intro. But can you just give us what you know about the, the origin story to Howarths? Like where did it come about? Where did the idea come from? What was your dad doing before? Yes, no problem. So my dad was, uh, had, a, had a tough upbringing and joined the police force when he was 19 year old. Uh, and did 30 years in the police until he was 49. So 30 years of public service in the police, of which he had a very successful career. And uh, he worked in special branch. He worked a lot in Ireland, in Hong Kong, and uh, very well in the police. At 49, he retired. But just prior to that, left school, my dad didn't have any A-levels or a degree or anything. Uh, so he went back to college on a Tuesday and Thursday night after work and first got his A-levels and then got a law degree in the last four or five years of his police career. Chris, my brother, they were only young then, so it was, it was quite a commitment to, to be able to do that whilst raising a family. So worked full time, went to night school on a Tuesday and Thursday night, got his A-levels, got a law degree and then set up the business on retirement when he was 50. Uh, <laughs> did employment law as part of his law degree and at the time a new piece of legislation was being introduced by the government which required businesses to follow a certain procedure when they were dealing with staff uh, disciplinaries it was a step one step two step three very prescribed process uh, and dad realized that there could be an opportunity here where businesses sme businesses in particular would need help piece of legislation and, and, and employment law generally. So, you know, he did his research, spoke to people and him and mum started the business from home uh, in room at home when my dad was 50 and mum just slightly younger. And my mum joined him because <laughs> numbers are, my, are not my dad's strong point. So <laughs> putting it lightly. So, um, so mum joined to help him, uh, you know, do the finances. And, but, but the remarkable thing about what my mum and dad did was a, my dad was 50 when he started the business. Um, B, he didn't have any qualifications and only got those from 45, 46 onwards. You know, and turning up to university as a mature student when the room is full of 
you know, young people is quite yeah, it takes some courage. Yeah, exactly. Especially when you've never been before, uh, you know, to and done higher education. Um, so to do that, but also you know, never been in business before. So didn't have any contacts, any, you know, it was a real standing start. Whereas a lot of businesses in our market are typically, and I'm generalizing now, but will typically be formed by a partner from a law firm, leaving, taking some clients, maybe taking one or two staff, part of their team and setting up. You've got a little bit of a start. Um, Mum and dad didn't have that. It was very from the, from the ground up. Um, and that was in, so the business was officially registered in 2003, um, which was when my dad retired and then uh, started. So, so had your dad already had the idea of launching Howard's before he retired from the police force? Like, What was the driver for him to go and study law at university? I think it was fair to say that my dad would, he loves work. So he, he couldn't have envisaged 49 or 50 and then playing golf or gardening or anything like that. So he knew he wanted to do something. He'd always had aspirations of running a business and being involved in the law. Obviously the police is, you know, with the law, if you're working in the police, but yeah. even that, my dad had done placements at solicitors in Leeds when he was a lot younger and been around solicitors. So I've sort of always had this idea of working in the law, working in his own business, but just didn't have, the opportunity, the right timing, the finances to make it work and it all come together until later in his life. Okay. Um, so when the business was launched in, you say around 2003, that's when it was yeah. firm, formally launched. How old were you at the time then, Gavin? Good question. What would I have been? Uh, what would I have been? We were born at the same time, weren't we? So yeah, old. about 17-ish, I would 17, imagine. 17, yeah. yeah. So and so so at that point, can you remember were you at sixth form university? Like what were your own aspirations at the same sort of time that your dad was setting the business up? So as you know, and I'm sure from many other guests, that whilst the business started in 2003, the thoughts and planning and aspirations and dreams about starting the business and what it might look like and do started a few years before that. Um, so, you know, mum and dad had had moments where they'd spoke about, you know, when I get to retirement, what might we do and what would we like to do? And I remember uh, on a family holiday to Centre Parks, uh, me and my dad uh, went for a drink and he'd said to me then that he was thinking about setting up a business and in the future, would I be interested? I must have been, yeah, maybe 17 around that time, something like that, to which yeah. I without hesitation was like yes definitely love to work with my family you know whatever that might look like uh you know let's give it a go so we had that conversation the seeds were sown and then you know it built from there but as you know there's no guarantee there's no guarantee with any of it what might happen it was just an idea and and, and then it gained momentum and then dad got you know the qualifications retired set it up even then so in 2004, I went to university, studied law. Um, you know, the business has only been going a year. It's, it's mum and dad at home in the front room and, you know, with one computer, one phone and a fax machine and trying to get it going. But we always sort of collectively had a dream that if it worked, I could go off and study, do my qualifications. And then perhaps one day, if, if the stars aligned, come back and give it a go between us. Okay, so you going into your own higher education and studying law, was that to prepare you for working in Howarth's, the family business, when you were completed those studies? Or was that something that you were already interested in anyway? Would you have done that if your father hadn't have started the business? Yeah, I'd have done it anyway. Yeah, I'd okay. have done it anyway, because the business was such in its infancy that you couldn't have sort of have any guarantees that that, that would be um, the right thing to do. And I enjoyed law anyway. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed my A-levels, I enjoyed school, I'm sort of a bit geeky academic, I suppose, in some ways, so to do law was great, I was happy to do that, and as I said, there were no guarantee, it may well have been that I did law, I did a training contract, uh, and the firm I worked for were fantastic, I did a full training contract, and you know, it might well be that I'd have stayed there and, and been a solicitor, and, but as it happened, the business continued, the conversations continued, and it, it just worked well in the end. 
Now, now that earlier conversation that your father had had with you in Centre Parks over that beer, where he said, I'm thinking of starting the business, would you be interested in joining me? For you, clearly, it was just like a, a hell yeah, that's something that I would love to do. It's not so much for other people that are asked to join the family business. What was it about your own family, working with your mum and your dad, that excited you, that, that gave you the sort of, not knowing, because you can never know what's going to happen in the future, but gave you the confidence that if you were to join the business, it was going to work well, all of you working together? Good question. I mean, I suppose being 17, you, you, you're not particularly wise to the world just yet. and you, you know, But as a family, we're very close. We, we always have been. Uh, I've got huge respect for mum and dad um, and admiration. And you know, even now at 36 and two kids myself and my own family, you know, we speak probably every day um, between us. And I just... For me, it seems so natural that if there was an opportunity to work with my parents' family, that I would absolutely just definitely give that a go. If it didn't work, it didn't work, and we moved on. But and just if you can combine the two, working with your family and um, you know and work, then it, it was something I wanted to do anyway. Okay, okay, and we'll come to. We'll come to now uh, as we get on, but obviously we know now you've been a, a successful MD in a you know a massively successful family business for, for what, nine years now. You've been in that position, yeah. And again, thinking back from even before you maybe you went to uni to to study law in your higher education, can you think of any like entrepreneurial traits or or signs that you showed in your earlier years that would maybe point you to the fact that you would be becoming a successful MD, regardless of whether it's a family business or not, you know, in 10, 15, 20 years time after that? This is a good question. You know, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I wasn't the type of person at school or who would have that sort of entrepreneurial story where, you know, I washed cars and made, made 10 quid and, and then sold lemonade outside or... <laughs> or you know I didn't have that sort of entrepreneurial flair as such but perhaps more I dare I say I don't know if it sounds if it sounds right but more leadership I think that there might have been uh, signposts and elements of my uh, school career and university career where it wouldn't have been a shock for me to, to see me take a leadership role if that makes sense okay yeah or but entrepreneurial no I just I couldn't I couldn't say that case as, as trading making money young and lots of business ideas etc but I did business at a level and I really enjoyed it and did well but I think perhaps the leadership element maybe <laughs> I feel really <laughs> self-promoting saying that but um yeah I think I think that's probably true yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you point that out because, like you say, not all of us have these stories of selling chocolate bars in the playground or, like you say, working the car wash, but we still go on to be successful leaders in businesses of all shapes and sizes. So I think that's a really good observation to make for anybody else that's thinking, well, I don't seem that entrepreneurial at the moment. Have I got you know leadership in my own future? But if, if, if for example, maybe 16, 17-year-old Gavin could have looked in a crystal ball and seeing the MD that you've become today, would he have been surprised or would he have thought, yeah, I knew I was going to get there quite quickly? It's, oh, it's, it sounds really arrogant, I suppose, but I think more the latter. I just yeah. think I've just got this, I don't know, I, I don't know if, just this concrete self-confidence. My wife jokes about it, actually, but, and maybe it's the, you know, it's from dad and mum and seeing what dad's done in his career, but where you just believe, genuinely, even just believe, but kind of know that you're just going to make this happen. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'd have hoped, I'd have hoped if I'd have seen a crystal ball at that age and seen myself as I am now in it, I think I'd have been like, please, I hope that comes true and I'm going to do everything to make it come true. Um, I suppose you can never know for certain, but I certainly do have a self-belief. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So you finished your law degree. You did your two years training in another firm. You then left, I presume, to join Howarths. Is that right? 
Yeah. At what position did you join Howis? Where did you come out in that business? So I joined as an employment law advisor and director, to be fair. I did join as a director um, straight away. The business was obviously a lot, lot smaller then. Um, we, we, it had moved out of obviously mum and dad's living room. We had a premises. Actually, it was called Law Street, the premises. <laughs> Perfect. No. We don't, we're not there now, but... Uh, so I joined, yeah, as, a, as an employment law advisor and director. But I don't, I don't want the director bit to sound as if it was something bigger than it wasn't really, because we were a small business then. Um, but yeah, I did join as that. Okay. And, and before you joined the business, was it just like a, a natural progression? Like you, you'd finished your placement in the previous business You'd come in to join Howarths. You knew what your role was going to be. How structured were the conversations around your parents and you in terms of like how you were going to progress through the business? Did you have those conversations early on or was it just the fact that you knew that if you put the work in, you were going to progress and eventually you know, reach a position of leadership and where you are now as MD? Again, I think, I think you ho- in terms of the conversations, how structured, um, probably not that structured. It was probably just a hope, a wish, an ambition, you know, that if one generation starts a business, that perhaps the next generation might be interested, um, might be good enough. You know, there's so many, so much water to go under the bridge and so many if, buts and maybes to actually make succession happen. So I think we all had, I think it's fair to say we were all on the same hymn sheet in terms of a hope and an aspiration that we might be able to make this work. You know, going back to our previous conversation, you know, from 17, I'd had the discussion. And so we all kind of hoped that, you know, I would join and it would be successful, but there was absolutely no guarantees. And I think like many family businesses, you know, dad and mum and dad gave, you know, didn't give me anything. Okay, I joined on a director, but there was nothing given. Everything, in fact, the hurdle's probably even higher <laughs> because you're having to sort of prove yourself even more. So we d- we didn't know, but we hoped, I think, that it was going to happen. And I suppose year by year, it just, you know, things flowed as life does and conversations happened and incrementally the conversation developed and grew into, you know, succession and, and, and roles and all that type of stuff. Okay. And, and when you joined the business for the first time, how many other people were there as well as your mum and dad? Mm, guessing around five maybe okay and was was your dad and your mum both still like an active part in the business then what yes so um, mum was finance um and dad was md yeah Um, okay and mum actually soon after i joined i don't know whether it were intentional um actually started to step down a little bit um so mum hasn't worked in the business now for probably nine years maybe phased down and stepped out of the business um, relatively quickly. So we only had a little bit of overlap. Um, and yeah, dad was MD at that time. Um, over those years, as you progressed through the roles, what sort of role did your your mum or your dad play in your own progression? Did they sort of leave you to it because they could see that you had the drive and the ambition? Or did they spend a lot of time with you? Or what does that look like from your recollection? Um, no, there was definitely input, without a doubt. You know, it's um, my dad's a brilliant. I don't know if he'd call it this, but he is a brilliant coach, mentor. So he finds opportune moments to deliver wisdom, uh, you know, and, and messages that you need to hear at the right times. And it'll be tough with it when if he, if he thinks you need, you know, uh, if you need that. And we had many of those times, but you know, lots of coaching and mentoring. And mum would be more different. It'd be the way mum did things. So for example, the way we run our accounts now, let's say 30 people, and then the types of business we are now is almost exactly the same way as mum ran them many years ago. The numbers are bigger and, you know, slightly more complex, but it's the same principles of financial management that mum put in place 20 years ago. Um, So mum was very much, you know, you watch and learn and she's very savvy mum. Nothing gets past her. And she's quite tenacious. But dad, yeah, dad particularly would be, would coach and mentor. And I remember one time where I came into work one day during that period before I became MD. So, you know, 24 to 27 year old. 
and came into work and with my head down, didn't really speak to anyone, went into my room and would work, could work, but I could easily just shut the door, could be introverted, just do my work and, you know, and then leave, come in, do my work, leave. And dad came in and had a word and said, look, if you're going to lead this business at some point in the future, you have to lead from the front and people will get their energy and cues from you. So yes, okay, you can you can have your days, you're human, not a robot, but generally speaking, you need to bring the energy, you need to bring the vibe, you need to lead from the front. And it's only a small lesson, but it's one that stuck in my mind since mm. many, many of those over the years, subtly, um, probably things that I think are my idea, but was actually my dad's and he's made him believe they were my idea, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, lots of that over the years. And it just, again, incrementally, probably quite a lot of the front end and then as the years go by and I start to spread my wings, then they probably become less and less and uh, as time goes on. And how did you used to deal with that constructive feedback from your dad? And, and has that changed over the years as you've perhaps seen that it is for your own benefit rather than just, you know, criticising because you're part of the family, etc. Like, How did you take that at the time? Yeah, I think quite well, because, um, again, I just had that respect and admiration for, for what dad had done and, and mum and how they operate and not just that they'd started a business, but the way they do it as well. Um, so I had no problem taking uh, feedback. I mean, I'm my own worst critic, so I give myself a hard time individually. So it can be hard to, to hear feedback, but I think, um, no, I mean, you couldn't not hear it from, from dad um, and mum. I mean, don't get me wrong. We had our moments. <laughs> Every family business has their moments, don't they? Me and dad, the, the old bull and the young bull, bull clash sometimes, yeah. and different opinions, and we had plenty of those episodes as well particularly in the early days but we got there we found a rhythm of communication um, and it's worked ever since and in fact just looking back so I so I'm 36 now I, when I became MD at 27 uh, the first year I became MD we had a good year financially so you know turnover profit that type of stuff and I remember I don't know why by email but I remember sending an email to mum and dad saying right I've done one year as MD let's go, pass me the business, I'm ready to go. You know, I'm obviously, I'm it. I know exactly what I'm doing. Like, I'm flying here. <laughs> um, and obviously, mum and dad were like, no, Gav, not, not just yet. You know, you've got to prove yourself. I look back now when I'm 36 at my 27-year-old self and think, what was I doing? What, what a good year, and you think, you're, you think you're the next Alan Sugar. Um, it's always but, easy to look back at these things with hindsight, though, isn't it? And that's it's, it's actually going to be one of my next questions because – it sounds like in terms of your own progression through the business, you were quite content with the fact that eventually you were going to get, you know, your reward for the effort that you're putting in. Whereas sometimes you can have it, like you say, the young bill comes in, they want to change everything, take the business to the next level, want to be, you know, manager in one day, MD the next day, owning the business the day after. Whereas the parents are more, we need you to take your time, learn the business like the back of your hand. And when we're ready, you can have these positions of leadership but so often you find that that's not actually communicated and you've got one side working on this assumption, one side working on this assumption. And then eventually, you know, both sides get frustrated with progress or lack of, and it can boil over. Like how, like what would be your tips for anybody else joining the family business, especially when you are young, ambitious, hungry, motivated, you want everything tomorrow, especially in this, you know, instant gratification world with Instagram and everything else in terms of, you know, making sure that there is going to be progress, but it's realistic progress. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a real tough one because you're right, Ben, that all the characteristics which make you successful and make you right for a leadership position in a business, the, the uh, hungriness, the, the, the dedication, the commitment, the ambition, the self-confidence, are the very same traits which, if not kept in check, can cause the relationships in the business to fracture, especially with your mum and dad. So, in, in that little case in point that I gave there when I was 27, thinking I could rule the world after one good year, mm. example of that, but I think in your 20s, or let me speak for myself, in my 20s, you, you like that, you, you, you're a young bull, you, you push in, you don't particularly understand the world, but you think you do and you go for it and you can't understand why after, you know, you've proved yourself 12 months, surely I've proved myself. But 
you realise now, looking back with a bit more maturity, you know, you start to realise everything that you don't know <laughs> as you get older. The more you do know, the less, you know, the more you realise you don't know. And you think, I, I were absolutely right to be pushed back at that point. And I think one of the biggest things as well for me has been patience. You know, that old adage that patience is a virtue and it's absolutely true and it's not always easy to practice, but, you know, you have to be patient. And, and I had ultimate respect for what mum and dad did. And I've said, and it goes back to what we were saying before, that I wasn't entrepreneurial by nature. And I'm probably not by nature. I, I, I say often to my dad and others that I'm not sure I could have done what dad did. I don't know if I'd have had the, it'd have been daring enough, had the conviction, taken on the financial debt uh, and taken the massive risk that he did to start it. Um, so I had ultimate respect for that just on that basis alone. Um, whereas, and dad may say the same on the, on the flip side, the reason why it's worked so well is because perhaps then growing a business from, you know, a small team to then something more corporate systemized processes, and branding and taking it up next levels. It's not, maybe not dad's thing, but it is mine. So we sort of, well, I think in that respect, and both had a very mutual respect for each other's skills. Well, I'm going slightly off topic, but another interesting thing about this communication is we got uh, a personality profile in me and dad a couple of years back. Okay. Insights. You might have seen it. You probably have. So it's red, blue, yellow, green, and you're given an insights color and it gives you indications to your personality type and communication styles. There's many Myers-Briggs and DISC, et cetera, but mm -hmm. insights and when mine, me and dad did ours, we were the exact opposite. Wow. So dad was sort of the far end of yellow and I was the far end of blue. And, and on a circle, these are like, opposites. so you can be sort of close to the middle or far away. And we were both far away. So you couldn't have two people with such differing personality and communication styles. He, he, yellows are very sort of exuberant, inspirational, storytellers, can be impatient, uh, you know, entrepreneurial perhaps. Mm -hmm. Blues, lawyers tend to be blue because they uh, need to know the detail, uh, meticulous, that type of stuff. And at the, at the back of the report, it gives you ideas about how you communicate with your opposite number. So when I speak, to, when a blue speaks to a yellow, when I speak to dad, I know that if I'm going to say something to him, it has to be, it has to be light, it has to be airy, just give headline points, don't be boring, don't spend too long on a certain topic, um, be prepared and be, expect, be, be expected that you're going to go off on tangents, but you might find your way back eventually, but keep it light, keep it funny and keep it headline. And for a yellow to speak to a blue, so dad speak to me, it'd be gavel, want to know the detail, make sure you have the detail, make sure you go through it all meticulously in a nice order, so he needs to get it all in his head first. You know, so it was it was very interesting that a father and son who are so close can have such differing personality and communication types. But I think understanding that and making it work has been a key to to us eventually achieving succession. Yeah, so that's a really nice point. And you've obviously discovered that and have made adjustments to how you communicate to each other. But with you both being on those opposite ends of the spectrum, and again, it's always so easy to look back with hindsight. Can you look back over the years previous and have seen, particularly when you've had those conflicts that you mentioned earlier, which happen in every business, whether it's son and father, you know, direct um, member of staff, can you see how not knowing that might have affected those conversations previously? Definitely. 100%. Because I, I, would, I go into a meeting with dad uh, about a business topic with my blue head on, which was, so uh, I'm, it's ordered, it's meticulous, it's the detail. Dad is coming from the perspective of the exact opposite. So I'd go into his room, we'd have a conversation, he'd do 30 seconds on the topic I've gone into, and then say, anyway, Gav, you know, what about this, uh, what about Leeds United's last result? Or, hang on a minute, let me just shut the door. It's a bit cold in here, don't you think? Do you want a cuppa while we sat here? Or let's chat about this uh, future business. You're like, Dad. Come in to talk about this particular subject. I haven't done anything. I've been here forty-five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know that, 
And if you know, well, actually, it's down to personality types. It's it's about how we view the world. It's about how we communicate. Then, you know, you enter with your eyes open. I relax about it. Dad relaxes about it. We know we'll get there in the end with a bit of compassion and understanding about how we both approach certain things and we make it work. But absolutely right, without knowing that, it's a recipe for, for, for conflict. Nice. Okay. What would you say, you know, taking that aside, growing up in the family business, working with mum, dad, a fairly small team at the time, what would you say were some of the, the challenges or maybe even downsides, if you can think of any, of being in that position in the family business? Um, downsides compared to working somewhere else or being employed or just just anything that springs to mind really I suppose you've had that experience of having the two years of training so technically whilst I suppose you weren't employed in another business you've experienced life in another business so yeah. if you wanted to use that as context yeah that absolutely makes sense um, yeah I mean I think the the biggest difficulty is at that time, seeing my mum and dad as my employer so and coming to terms with what that means in terms of your, com your communication and the way you view each other. You know, I, I wasn't guaranteed a job at the firm I was at, for certain, but I, I may have got one had I have sort of you know, said that I wanted to continue there. Um, and I would have been on more money than I joined Howarth. So I sort of, you know, took a... Not a pay cut per se, because as I say, I wasn't guaranteed, but it certainly felt a little bit like that. So it was to come to the business, but yeah. yeah. So I'd come to the bit, you don't know how it's going to go in the future. You, you don't know if it's going to work. You join in a business where your mum and dad are now your employer as well as your mum and dad. Um, and trying to navigate how do we communicate with each other? How do we do it outside of work and in work? It was complicated. And I do remember a time where you know, there was certainly, and we talked about the communication styles, there were certainly frustrations and, you know, my dad, my dad doesn't understand me or when is it going to move forward quicker or I think we should be doing this and we're not. Lots of that type of stuff uh, at the start. It's, in fact, it, it, as you move on in your career, you don't often, well, I don't often spend time looking back, but it's interesting to look back at those early years and actually how many challenges you probably as a family collectively overcame to get where we are now you forget about that bit of it because it's all good now <laughs> yeah yeah so and, and you mentioned there in terms of you know working out how you would communicate would you talk outside of work about business etc did you put any did you decide as you know as a family unit to put any boundaries in place so if you sat at the dinner table in the evening was it you know no holds barred or business is off limits no not really nothing formal i suppose it just the boundaries and culture evolved iteratively as we went on, I think. So, yeah, I mean, family table, no, it would be mentioned. It definitely would be. Actually, mum's got quite firm on that re more recently. So often, me, you know, dad will, I'll get to his house, drop the grandkids off. Oh, God, let's have a, let's have a quick word. <laughs> Chin and have a quick word. Um, but no, I mean, you know, mum, mum founded the business with dad. So she knew that a family business is, it's all encompassing, isn't it? It's it's your whole life. It, it's it's not just your professional life. It's your personal life. It, it it bleeds into every part of of the family unit, really. So we didn't have any rules or regulations that it certainly should stop at certain moments. It, the conversation it was just very natural, and at, at times you might be like, right, come on now, we've had enough. Let's let's just uh, let's just crack on. I, I think one thing though that. You, and me and dad have spoken about this. And I think we have probably paid a price to some degree is your father son relationship. Because, you know, when you work in business together and, you know, dad being MD, me being director, then me latterly becoming MD and then dad chairman. And now dad's become CEO of the foundation. We've been working together for 11 years. And because you see each other every day in work or not as much, you know, not every day now, but, the vast majority every day you feel like you've seen your dad but you haven't really you know because you've been talking about work you're in, you're in the context of a co-director or employer employee whatever so I, I do think there is some price to pay in your father some relationship unless you work hard at it and be conscious of it and same with your, your mother's son relationship as well but just because you know mum left the business nine years ago that's been a little easier because 
um, it, you know, it hasn't been as direct, but certainly when we were going through the deal as well, you know, and, and getting the succession deal done, that, that was tricky in its own right. But keeping you, I think you do pay a price in your, in your family relationships to some degree. Okay. So, yeah. And I think there's some real honesty there and I appreciate you for sharing that. So if you, if you could take that insight back to like the last week of when you were training as a solicitor in the previous business and you were, you were given the two choices as in you can stay on in this business and, you know, have a successful career here, or you can go and join the family business and be, you know, be the, the Gavin that you are today, but, potentially lose some of that father and some relationship but at the time which one do you think you'd have chosen definitely family <laughs> i just yeah. still i just still done it i want to change your thing because yeah you, you you do sacrifice some but i'm just very grateful that we the three of us including mum you know have just navigated it and my brother because he you know whilst he's got his own business he's still involved in all the discussions and but we've just navigated it really well i'm really proud of us actually for the way we've done it because we still love each other to bits, despite, you know, all the business and it all intertwined with business and money and aspirations and all that type of stuff. We still fundamentally love each other to bits. So, yes, there has been some sacrifice, but, you know, we work hard. We we'll go for a pint. We watch Leeds United. We have fun together outside of work as well. And But that, that certainly got easier, I think, when you, when you can sort out the professional bit if you know what I mean. So I think it's really important that you do have your defined roles, it's very clear what you're doing, what you're responsible for, because I think if there's some confusion or overlap or friction, then if you have that in work, it's going to bleed outside of work, isn't it? Because the whole thing's wrapped up together. Yeah, so make sure you've got real clarity about what's expected of you and what you expect of mum and dad as well. You've got to, haven't you? I think you've got to have the conversations and just be open. Yes. Yeah. So, nice. And those, those times where you do have disagreements and that's bound to happen like we say whether it's a family business or not and knowing what you know now like what would be your advice to the younger generation moving through the business when they do have disagreements or fallouts with mum or dad like what's the best way of being able to deal with that and, and handle it in the best way very practically speaking leave it 24 hours nice I think, you know and i still do this now with lots of stuff just don't do anything for 24 hours and you still and check how you feel about it the next day in 24 hours and it's often very different from how you feel with it feel mm. about it. and perspective you just have to zoom out of the situation and have perspective you know i've always seen myself as very privileged to even have the opportunity to work in a family business and i posted about it on linkedin recently i said to mum and dad when when we start getting closer to the deal happening um and throughout, I'd walk away before I fell out with mum and dad. I'd, I'd, I'd back myself to go get another job and be able to build a, a relatively decent life for my wife and kids and, and myself without the family business. Um, but I'd walk away before I fell out with mum and dad. So I was just always grateful for, for the relationship I had. I tried to keep as much perspective as possible, remained patient, and, um, yeah, waited 24 hours. Um, and generally speaking, well, I mean, it worked, I suppose, didn't it? It worked. We, we love each other to bits. Succession's happened. We're all happy in our roles. Um, but yeah, I think because it, it's the emotions, isn't it? You, you have to be in control of your, of your emotions. And yeah, it, it's, I'm, not, I'm not clever enough to understand the complexities of a father-son relationship or a, a son-mother relationship and intertwining that with layers of you know, personal relationship, business, money, aspirations you know competencies what, what you believe comp your competencies are etc it's just so complicated that you have to give it time be patient be gentle be respectful um and i think if it's meant to be it'll be but i think yeah i mean you 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 will see it more than me i'm sure but we see it amongst our clients but a lot of family businesses unfortunately is sad don't make it because of all that, you know, all that layered complexity and then trying to navigate it all, it's emotions are so high, it's hard. Yeah, no, I think that's a really solid, sound advice, though. So I appreciate you for sharing that. So we've talked a little bit about or gone into the sort of, not that there were really many downsides of working in the family business, 
Uh, what are the upsides to it? What are the things that you've really enjoyed about starting your career in the family business, growing with it and becoming, you know, a successful MD that's been in that position now for almost a decade? Oh, I just, I love my job. I, I'm one of those saddos who when people talk about work and I sort of tend to be on the outskirts of the conversation because the typical conversation about work is, uh, you know, my boss or my hours or they're not listening to this or I've got a nightmare boss. My response has always been, I love work. <laughs> right? So I'm, you know, I love getting up on a Monday morning. I love the excitement of it. Um, I love the variety. I love the, I love working with people. I love the team here. I've got a brilliant team of people. Um, I love seeing my dad every day and being able to, you know, have banter and chat with him. And um, I love the life it's creating for uh, for me and my family, but also mum and dad and, and, you know, their world and and also the staff, um, you know, seeing them reach their potential, which they perhaps didn't even think they had within themselves and building their lives, and particularly Tracy, Charlotte, who were, you know, directors of the business and been here many years. Um, yeah, there's so many positives. Like, I, I, I love the business. Um, uh, yeah, love everything about it. Yeah, no, you can always definitely tell when somebody's genuinely passionate about something. And I would say without a doubt, you are most definitely still after all these years so passionate about working at Howarth and being a part of the family business. But I also get from looking at your, your social media platforms online, it's not just, you know, the family business that you're passionate about. You've also got a real passion for leadership. You know, a lot of your LinkedIn posts, some of them, you know, getting thousands of likes, some of them tens of thousands of likes you've clearly got a real passion for, um, you know, being a, a real, a great leader of people in the business. Where do you think that passion comes from? It, does that come from seeing how your dad operates over the years as you were growing up? Has it come from seeing how your mum operates? Or is it just something that you found yourself naturally drawn to? Probably a mix of all of the above, but I'd, certainly a lot of inspiration from mum and dad. But I'd, I do think I'm, I don't know, just naturally drawn to it. Like, whilst being introverted to some degree, which sounds strange to say, I do love people. Um, I love working with people. And I've realised as I've transitioned from being an employment law solicitor into an MD, you know, that wasn't an easy transition and it's been incremental. But I realise where I get my energy from and, and the jobs I do. And, and, and a big part of it is people. I love working with people. I love seeing people reach the potential. Um, I, I love building a team and it's it, you know it's, it sounds weird to say it because these are often the subject matters which a lot of business owners hate <laughs> um, mm. people side of it and building teams and how unpredictable people are and they are it's unpredictable it's tough it's emotional it's hard but for me that's where all the excitement is as well um, and I, you know, I don't want to get to the end of my career Ben and regret anything and I realised that turnover, uh, you know, other metrics are not going to be what I'm thinking about or talking about when I get to get to my deathbed, whenever that may be. Um, I want to be successful, of course, and money often follows doing good things anyway. But but I will remember the times when, you know, I gave a pay rise to someone and, and they got teary-eyed or you have a big hug afterwards or, you know, the members of the team got promoted and, or did a big presentation when they used to hate public speaking. Or, and I remember all these little things that the team have achieved and and then we've ch achieved collectively. So, yeah, I think the story for Howard starts and ends with the people, um, whether, you know, with the family, but the wider team as well, like Tracy RFD and shareholder, she owns 15% of the business, has been with the business since she was 17. She's younger than me, but she's been with the business 17 years. And, you know, it is like family. Charlotte, our legal director, who owns 5% as well, she's been with us 11 years. Justine, 12 years. Helena, nine. Like, a lot of long service. Um, and we've all been through a lot together as well, you know, and had families and heartache and traumas, but we've done it together on the journey, and that's that's the exciting bit for me. Yeah, OK. I, I, can, I can most definitely see that as well. And it's interesting they say that, not just because you've come from that sort of law background and, and numbers and facts and data into emotions and psychology and people, but also the way you describe yourself on the, the opposite end of that 
blue spectrum. And you mentioned a few moments ago that you did find it a challenge transitioning from that into an MD. So uh, what were the challenges specifically for you of becoming, you, you clearly had a vision for the type of leader that you wanted to be at the time. Like what was the main challenge in you actually becoming that person and, and how, were, how, did, how did you overcome those challenges? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um... Oh, where do I start? I think. For, for example, for a, you, you described yeah. yourself a few moments ago as, as almost an introvert. Yeah. But I don't think anybody watching or listening to this would see you as, you know, the dictionary definition of an introvert. And clearly yeah. from the sounds of it, from what that's something that you've had to work on and develop. You mentioned giving a public speech in front of people when that wasn't something that you would have enjoyed at the time. Yeah. But what, what were those you know, specific challenges that, that stand out. Yeah, and, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, leadership is difficult, isn't it? And, and some bits come naturally and, and some bits don't. I think a big part of it is self-awareness though, isn't it? Because whether you're a, you know, going back to the personality profiling, whether you're a red, a blue, a green or yellow, the point is that all the personality types have advantages and natural inclinations but all also have a dark side, let's say, you know, where, where you're not your best self. Um, so I think being aware of what those strengths are and what those weaknesses are is half the battle. And I think the business only grows as much as you grow as a leader. So I you know, through a huge evolution over the years of trying to improve myself, if you like, and self-improvement and um, become the best leader possible. But I think, one way to, there's two schools of thoughts on how you deal with the weaknesses in your personality from a leadership point of view is one, you work on your weaknesses and try and improve them. Or the second is acknowledge you've got the weaknesses, accept you've got them, but just double down on your strengths and put other people around you who complement your weaknesses. So I'll give you a specific example. I'm too soft a lot of the time, Ben, on, on, with people. So we, uh, I'll give you an example. So, uh, well, without going too specific, we had a member of staff who, who, who wasn't performing in the business. And um, very obvious from quite early on in joining us that uh, not at the right level. Even with a, a ton of evidence that the, the, they weren't at the right level, I had the meeting, heard the explanations as to why, I obviously followed all the right process, as you'd imagine, and uh, I asked the employee to leave the room while we had a, a, a second to talk about it. It was me and uh, 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 our legal director, Charlotte. And the member of staff left the room, despite the overwhelming case that the employee was going to struggle to make the grade. Uh, I said to Charlotte, is, is there a way we can make it work, do you reckon? I think we can find a way to make this work. Charlotte's like, no, absolutely not. You know, it, it, it is what it is. So anyway, it, it happened. But, you know, I, I, I can be too soft with people at times. Um, so what do I do? I either work on becoming harder, if you like, or more ruthless or whatever it might be, or I surround myself with people who are naturally inclined to be a little bit tougher because that's their personality. And I, I subscribe to the latter personally. So, uh, you know, I've surrounded myself and made sure our leadership team complements me so that between us as a team, there aren't many gaps, if you like, where we all individually have gaps, but we might fill each other's gap. I don't know whether that's right or wrong or whether you should focus on your weaknesses and try and improve them, but what I want to try and do is work out what my one, two or three superpowers are, if you like, and just double, triple, quadruple down on them and then get other people around me to, to complement my weaknesses, which are their strengths, and they double, triple, quadruple down on them. So that I think, yeah, that I think, I think you made basically. a smart choice there. Yeah. So, so, so it's interesting. What would you say are your two or three superpowers? <sighs> yeah, good question. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I think, yeah, whatever I say, I think leadership, vision, strategy, I think I'm relatively strong on strategy, um, um, taking opportunities, 
Yeah, something along those, Ben. I don't know. It's hard to say, yeah. isn't it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's always it's always hard to blow your own trumpet in these circumstances. But part of it is this is the reason for it. You've obviously put in a lot of hard work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and and you've you've been successful as a result. So now is the time to sort of recognise those strengths. So, but those ones that you mentioned there, strategy, vision, leadership, you also mentioned, and obviously you are quite self, you know, massively self aware. There's always a dark side to a strength if it's taken to the extreme. Of what are some of the dark sides to those strengths? Have you seen them, how they've affected the business from your own perspective? Yeah. So, for example, let me, if I talk about the strategy one, it's, there's a risk with, with that of overthinking, over planning, over strategizing um, to the point where you don't get stuff done. So, um, or, or, or you, you create an inertia or a block in the business. When the truth is, the actual truth is, uh, good enough is enough. Get going, launch it, you know, iterate afterwards, perfect it afterwards, but get going. So I think that the, the, it doesn't matter what your strengths and weaknesses are to some degree. The key is being aware of what they are. <laughs> and, and, and then when you're aware of what they are, you can act accordingly, aren't you, and be, and be conscious of them. So if I know that, you know, I will be naturally inclined to strategize, for example, and and plan and be meticulous and like to know the facts. I can also counteract that slightly. If I know that's my natural inclination, then I can push myself in areas that I can feel slightly uncomfortable, but I'm aware that I'm like that. So I can push it, go for it and adapt. You can't do that if you don't know that in, in the mm. first place. So yeah, the, absolutely. I mean, I, I say that all the time. It's funny you should say that, but all these personality traits, whatever they are, the, 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 there's two sides to the same coin, aren't there? Mm pluses and minuses, whatever they may be. So there's, that's the beauty of it, though, the beauty of personality, and there's no right or wrong. It's just whatever your traits are or what they are, whoever you are is who you are. That's absolutely brilliant. We're all individual. I think it's just being aware of that. That's half the battle. This whole thing is a journey of self-discovery in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah, uh, a never-ending one. Never-ending, ab- absolutely. And it changes and it evolves and it moves. But, yeah, I think being aware of them um, and then, then you've got the ability to sort of keep them in check yeah yeah I, I love that perspective in fact that was going to be my next question is like how do you keep them in check but you've already perfectly described it if you're aware of it then you can be conscious of it and make the necessary adjustments now the sort of the final question on leadership because we've almost been going for an hour and i know you've got a bunch of stuff to do so i, I don't want to keep you too long but it's been I've oh, loved the conversation so far it's been fascinating so so if you was to score yourself as a leader of Howarth's on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being, you know, who, well, f- let me ask you first, is, are there any leaders out there, be it local, be it close to you, or be it, you know, social media, worldwide superstars that you look up to when you were asked, you know, who do you look at as a great leader? Is there anybody in particular that springs to mind? Good question. Well, I've got, I've got two, pe- two framed pictures on my wall. I'm a big sports fan. So, okay. No, in fact, I've got three. Uh, I'm just no, it's one on my desk. Uh, Kevin Simfield, the Leeds Rhinos. Okay. Lucas Radebe, who played for Leeds. Um, and Jamie Peacock as well, uh, another Leeds Rhinos rugby league player. There's definitely a connection there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You're obviously a Leeds yeah. man through and through. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, even people like um, James Milner, plays for Liverpool from Leeds. Um Dare I say, I did quite, yeah. Who else was on the list? I mean, I think sports-wise, yeah. yeah. I, in a way, the, oh, I don't even know if it's right to say this, but you could you could sort of categorise these, and some of them actually have been accused of it, have just been so consistently boring in their, in their achievements. They're all absolute world beaters in their own right. Um, you know, Kevin Sinfield, the top point scorer in rugby league history, you know, and it just unbelievable professionals but almost so consistently boring in a way you know there's nothing flash they never end up in the paper they're, they're just every day turn up professional ultimate professionals execute day after day week after week month after month year after year and and carve out a brilliant career as a result of it um and you know a lot of these guys go down in history so they're the type of people that i would look up to who yeah. 
not flashing the pan, but doing just so consistently high level for so long. That's who I'm I'm personally in awe of. Yeah, great answer. I love that. So if you, if you could combine all of those attributes into one like melting pot of a leader, and if you could score yourself from naught to ten on your own leadership abilities and who you are as MD at Howard's, where would you put yourself on that scale right now? And you're allowed to blow your own trumpet, by the way. This is if you're ever going <laughs> to blow, it, like, now is the time. Or well, maybe. Seven, if I were being generous, eight, maybe. I don't, you'd have to ask the team to rate me, I suppose, but I feel seven to eight. I hope with plenty of room for improvement, but hopefully in the main doing an half decent job. What would you say, what would you say is your sort of next focus area or area of development that's going to push you to that eight, if it's a seven or nine, if it's an eight? Good question. Good question. I, I, you know what? I, I think I'd probably like to spend more time sort of maybe coaching and developing. I think it's about me stretching myself further to be able to help the team more, if that makes sense. And I, and I think, well, for me, say, this is going sort of backwards a little bit, but joining a family business that I didn't start is one thing you've always got a little bit of a burden that you didn't start it you're coming in you're a custodian okay you've grown it and and whatever on the figures and taking it to new levels but you didn't start it so I've always felt this sense of gratitude but also you know going into the MD and then owner you know transitioning to an owner of the business I I own the business 80% now and Tracy 15 Charlotte 5 the majority owner, it's a different type of thinking. You know, the personal guarantee for the business is now on my house and all the rest of it that comes with owning a, owning a business. Um, and I think redefining what work is. So, you know, I, I sometimes still feel a sense of guilt if I'm not in the work. business. Yeah. In, in the traditional sense. Yeah, of in, exactly right. In the business. I still feel that every now and then. You know, I can feel it inside me where I, whereas what I really need to do, and I know it's right, is release myself completely. You know, I, sorry, I, I was on a, a call the other week with a, an, an eminent speaker about a particular subject. She's spoken all over the world. And she just by chance happened to mention her diary and said, Fridays are reading days. And, and I felt inside me a little twinge of, so one of your work days, in inverted commas, is reading. Like, work. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because I still have this mindset of if you're not grafting in, you know, in a, in a sense what work is defined as. But of course, I know that it has to be true that to be creative, you need to you need to create time and space. You need to come away. You absolutely makes sense to have a reading day, <laughs> but having the sort of confidence and the lack of guilt to do that. But sorry, long answer to your question, but going full circle to become a better leader for the business and for the people in it, certainly the senior leadership team and, and the guys reporting in, that is probably what has to happen, is for me to free up, give more space, give more autonomy, delegate more, uh, and feel less guilt and redefine what work is in this new role uh, to, to give space and encouragement and coaching to the rest of the guys. Uh, you've nice. just really helped, actually. You've just, you've just coached me. <laughs> well, that's what I do. <laughs> well, 10 out of 10 answer, though. 10 out of 10 answer, most definitely. So I've, I've just got a couple more conversations. I could honestly stay on for the rest of the afternoon, but I don't, don't want to keep you because you need to get to your reading afternoon. Um, <laughs> exactly. If, if you could only pick three attributes, whether it's attributes you feel you exhibit yourself or from those leads, um, leaders that you mentioned a few moments ago, if you could only pick three attributes of what you think are the key ingredients of a successful leader, whether it be on the pitch or in business, what three would you go for? Leading from the front, I think you have to demonstrate. It's, it's do as I do, not as I say. I think people take cues off you and how you act and what you say all the time. So I think you have to lead from the front. Compassion, empathy, vulnerability, if I could dare categorise those as, as one. The yeah. norms, you know, I, I, I sort of I've read a lot around with Brenia Brown. I don't know if you've heard, heard of her, but she talks a lot about vulnerability and 
a lot of what people call soft skills. Yep. Uh, and uh, she said something very interesting, which I saw a couple of weeks ago, which was many, many years ago, we used to lead by muscle. Uh, we then led by brain. The future of leadership is by heart. And I, I love that. Um, and I could just resonate with me so deeply that, the, you know, especially with the advent of technology and machines being able to do 15, 20, 100 times what, you know, the human brain can do on yeah. day, et cetera. That, but one thing I think they'll struggle to replace is heart, compassion, empathy, emotional intelligence, vulnerability, all that type of stuff. And mm -hmm. then my last one is probably the adage that a leader works for the team, not the other way around. If there was one fundamental principle that I keep in my head at all times is I work for the team, not the other way around. I, I, I never, I never use the word boss. I always try desperately hard to avoid anyone saying people work for me. Like all that terminology, I never use any of that because I just genuinely believe my job is to create the environment, the space, give the tools, give the belief, the vision to the team and let them do it. Um, so I work for the team, not the other way around, would be my third one. Three great attributes there. Nice. That's going to make a great snippet on LinkedIn as well. Love that. So thank you for sharing that. And it's always so hard when you put on the spot with these questions as well. So the fact that you're able to come up with such a great answer definitely says a lot about your own leadership and your own self-awareness. That but we've, you know, we've definitely uncovered the fact that you've got massive self-awareness of your own strengths, weaknesses, etc. So that I've got two more questions. One's a simple one, but one's slightly, it's like the last brain tangler for the afternoon okay. because. It's quite emotionally, energetically draining these interviews, but I like to uh, I like to try and ask some good questions to make it worth your while. So, if you could take all of that experience from seventeen years working in the family business, working your way up through the family business, being managing director for the last nine years, all these things that we've just talked about with regards to leadership, if you could hop in a time machine and visit whether it was 18, 19 year old Gavin that had just finished uni, or then he had his two years in the other business, but was just about day one of starting at Howarth's, and you could only give him one piece of advice that you think would see him fare best throughout these next 17 years, what's the one thing that you'd say to him? Oh, the first thing that comes to mind is... If that's what it wants to be, yeah, that's usually the best one. Relax and enjoy yourself. Nice. And enjoy yourself you know it's um i mentioned it to my dad the other day i've been listening to a song recently by k tempest or i think it's called more pressure and there's a line in it which is um less push more flow and it just resonated with me because i think life has a rhythm it's a dance and it has a flow and i think when you fall boss isn't right Less push, more flow. So I'd probably say to my 17-year-old uh, self, relax, enjoy the ride, and don't waste any life worrying and about things. Just go with the flow, and life life is meant to be. Nice. Well, a great answer to wrap it up on as well. My, my final question, and this is a bit of an easy one, Gareth. For anybody that wants to follow you online, I'm sure there will be many after listening to all your insights and experiences and especially to keep up with your journey on um, on your social media platforms or whether it's finding out about Howards. Whereabouts can we find you online? Uh, thanks, Ben. So the website is one www.howards-uk.com. That's just about the business. But I'd probably say the best place is my LinkedIn. I, I don't post on any other platforms. I don't even have any personal ones, really. It's just all on LinkedIn, but it gives an insight into our journey and some of the values and that type of stuff. So um, my LinkedIn profile, which is just Gavin Howarth, is, is probably the best one. Okay, awesome. Well, let's see if you get a few more followers, although I think you've got quite a few going now with all these viral <laughs> posts you've been uh, making lately. <laughs> but I really want to thank you for your time, Gavin. I absolutely love the conversation. Hope you've enjoyed it too. Just want to wish you and the team at House all the best for the future and look forward to seeing how you can continue to grow on LinkedIn. Thanks, Ben. I absolutely loved it. Really enjoyed it. So thanks very much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. See you again soon. See you soon. I love that conversation with Gavin and could have gone on for a lot, lot longer. So a huge shout out to Gavin for being an outstanding guest on the show. I definitely threw in a couple of curveballs there, but he came back with some brilliant answers with almost no hesitation. And I'm sure that you'll join me in agreeing that Gavin came across as an authentic, genuine, and brilliant family leader in business with a very bright future ahead of him. And all the best to Gavin and the rest of the team at Howarths. 
Now, if you're a leader in the family business, you should check out a free guide that I've put together at nextgenbusinesscoaching.com, which is called 25 Ways to Level Up Your Impact as a Leader in the Family Business. You can go ahead and grab yourself a free copy over at the website. That address again is www.nextgenbusinesscoaching.com. Nextgen, N-X-T-G-E-N, businesscoaching.com. So thanks for listening. Thanks for your support as always. If you enjoyed the show, which I hope you did, please feel free to leave a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcast to help spread the good word. And of course, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode with another brilliant next generation leader in family business. So remember, outstanding next generation leaders aren't born, they're made. So get to it, get out there, make it happen, and I'll see you on the next episode.